Welcome to the Age of Mass Politics lecture. As you go through these slides, make sure that you have your handout displayed on the screen or printed so that you can annotate it. The quotation from Palmer and Colton is accurate. However, why, uh, historians might say obsolete at this point in what we call a post-Westphalian world. If you remember, the Treaty of Westphalia established the formation of the modern nation state. And this was the infant element of political expression in most of Europe throughout the first half of the 19th century. And then it establishes itself in the second half of the 19th century, according to these paradigms that Palmer and Colton are pointing out here, common future, common religion, common geographical home, common culture, all of that exclusivity that we begin to find suspect in the global world of the 21st century as we become more integrated and interconnected really is essential to what we consider the 19th, early 20th century nation state. And then of course, a common history, <clears throat> which I really uh, like about the Palmer Colton quotation is they say sometimes imagined more often than not imagined and manipulated for political regimes as a matter of fact but a common history very important to promote different political agendas at this time. So uh, history very important in the establishment of the nation state. We're gonna start with Italy because Italy, uh, the resurgimento or the unification of Italy in 1860 is what sets off a chain of events leading us right up to World War I, the great disaster of the early 20th century. If you take a look at your map here, you'll see that Italy is very fragmented. As a matter of fact, I've been to Italy often, and the times that I've been there, and I've been to Milan, Florence, Bologna, uh, Naples, Rome, uh, Ravinia, all, all over the country, people identify, at least in my general experience um, with the population, provincially. They are more likely to call themselves a Florentine than an Italian in the city of Florence. So there's still a, a great deal of fragmentation in Italy today. But if you look at the major powers who have influence over Italy mid 19th century, you'll notice that France, uh, in the Northwest has uh, a, a power block. You have uh, France also in the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, the Bourbon monarchy is present there. The Papal States, uh, which are quickly becoming less and less powerful in Central Italy. And then the Austrian Empire has interests in Northeastern Italy, particularly in uh, modern day Venice or Venetia at the time. So if you take a look at your handout, what I have done is laid out the different uh, political geograph geopolitical interests and um, the uh, different uh, international interests in Italy at the time of unification. And the leaders of the attempt to unify Italy Italy come from different uh, sectors and different international interests. From Piedmont, you have uh, a technocrat, somebody who is very interested in modernizing government and uh, basically bringing Italy into the 19th century with the rest of modern European nation states, uh, Count Camille Cavour, is manipulating a royal family at the time with the hopes that he will be able to put Victor Emmanuel uh, the, the royalty in Piedmont, Sardinia, on the throne as the Italian monarch, which eventually he is able to do, but not on his own. Uh, there are other movements, the movements of the Carbonari, uh, the uh, movement of Giuseppe Manzini, who is in the lower left hand of this slide, um, who uh, 
um, anticipated the idea of a European Confederacy and wanted Italy to unify as a uh, modern republic, a democratic republic. Uh, and then <clears throat> we have the populist movement under Garibaldi, who is dressed in his uh, traditional Sicilian garments in the center of the slide and is able to rally uh, the agrarian population in Southern Italy against the Bourbon monarchy who had put an oppressive milling tax on the farmers. And um, he created a populist uh, military movement. He entered Naples uh, with his own army, his own militia, and swelled the ranks by passing out red shirts because that was their uniform red shirts to all of the um, dissatisfied population in Naples, and then began to march towards Rome. In the top left-hand corner, we have Victor Emmanuel, and in the bottom right-hand corner, his puppet master, Count Camille Abor. These are two political cartoons that I have seen on the exam, the AP exam often, uh, where there would this would be some type of prompt and then there would be multiple choice questions and what you have in the first one is an image of victor emmanuel putting on the italian boot uh, in a very you know princely or monarchical uh, attire and the shoe salesman or the person who's fitting him is garibaldi in his red shirt and in the right hand uh, cartoon we have a similar sort of image. Again, Garibaldi is the cobbler and he's working in concert with Cavour. And if you look at your handout, what you'll see is that uh, a whole uh, mess of geopolitical machinations occur uh, that lead up to a sort of meeting of the forces of Garibaldi and Piedmont Sardinia in Rome in 1861, at which point Victor Emmanuel is proclaimed the king of a unified Italy. And what I would like you to pay close attention to is that some of these political machinations uh, lead to resentments that last uh, for about 50 years, right up into uh, the World War I era, but that they also lay the groundwork for the unification of Germany. For instance, Austria is um, not only fighting to maintain control of Italy uh, during these uprisings and attempts to uh, make the country independent and unified, they're also fighting against France. And uh, because both countries have uh, interests in Northern Italy, and uh, basically, France is able to um, uh, leave uh, their interests in northern Italy, but attain or retain, rather, Nice and Savoy as a, uh, a sort of concession from Cavour and, and uh, Victor Emmanuel. And what Cavour and Victor Emmanuel do very um, wisely is they co-opt the movement of the red shirts. They sort of absorb that uh, to sort of quash Garibaldi's dramatic independence movement and bring it into the new um, regime and into supporting the new regime. This is the Vittoriano, which is a monument to Victor Emmanuel in the Unify, Unified Italy. <clears throat> it was uh, uh, built in 1878 and uh, actually uh, commissioned in 1878 and completed uh, in 1884. And what's interesting about it is it was sort of modified under Mussolini to reflect uh, fascist uh, expressions and um, to monumentalize part of his fascist regime. Uh, if you go there today, a lot of these uh, modifications have actually worn off uh, from weathering because of the materials that were used in the 1920s, not as strong as the uh, typical marble and stone used in buildings um, throughout historic Rome. You can see the actually 
you can see the Coliseum in the background on the left hand side of the image. Towards the end of the first page of your handout, you'll see the limitations of Italian unification. The North is more developed, more industrialized, and dominates Italian politics for the most part. And 70% of the population remains illiterate. This is sort of a, a, a common or general uh, disparity between Southern and Northern and Central European nations that I think continues to exist today. Uh, the financial centers uh, remain strong in the north and the further south, the further Mediterranean you get in Europe, the, the more underdeveloped uh, nations' economies are and northern economies taking advantage of southern economies, even right up through the most recent financial crash, uh, you have you know, the European Union uh, basically taking financial oversight or control or receivership over countries like Greece and um, Spain and Italy attempting to modify their social government structure and forcing them to pay <clears throat> tremendous uh, amounts of money in, in loans and debt to Northern European countries. Uh, this, this is certainly the case in the 19th century. And what you have here is a, a cartoon uh, with a, a caricature of the Risurgimento. Um, and all of the different factions and groups who are competing for control of a fragmented Italy and a fragmented Italy that still remains after the actual unification. Um, in particular, the, uh, the, the separation between um, international interests. So you have the tree is Napoleon III from France, you have the clergy's interests, you have the notion of the brigand or the uh, criminal class in Italy, which is very widespread, and uh, Garibaldi in the background plowing. And if you look at the bottom of the first page of your handout, you'll also notice that uh, there is a lot of instability that follows Italian unification, including an assassination of the uh, the, the king that follows um, uh, Victor Emmanuel uh, by an anarchist and uh, eventually uh, a move to imperialize Africa with many of the other European nations after the Munich conference uh, and then of course the subjection of the Italian population to fascism under Mussolini in the early 20th century. This is the door of a Ferrari celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Risurgimento. Moving into Germany, we have a cartoon of the typical Prussian helmet. Uh, the Prussian military was a dominant force in what we could consider a, a geographic area that we would call Germany or Deutschland. And the helmet uh, which resembles Imperial Rome um, and a Spartan approach to military is notable for its Pickelhoven, which is the spike on the top. And the cartoonist's point here is that if Germany is going to be unified under one power, it's most likely going to be a Prussian power. And the only competitor for that would be the uh, em empire of the Austrian-Hungarian um, a geographic space which is south of what we call modern Germany. And the major question, as we talked about in class, is what type of Germany is going to be uh, produced out of this tension? Is it going to be Grossdeutsch or Kleindeutsch? And Grossdeutsch meaning big Germany, meaning uh, a Germany that includes all of the different types of people living within this geographic area that is dominated by Austria-Hungary, or will it be a Kleindeutsch, a small Germany, that fits under the helmet of the Prussian auspice, meaning uh, Germany for Germans, German-speaking people, German people that share a common culture, a common history, 
And I think you know where it's headed based on the Palmer Colton quotation that we started the slideshow with. Three figures of German unification, uh, Prince Frederick William, Otto von Bismarck, and Franz Joseph. And what, I'm sorry, not Franz Joseph, Wil Wil Wilhelm I. Uh, what we see happening here is Frederick William of Prussia is not in line with what most of the population wants in the northern German provinces. He basically rejects the offer of a crown from the Frankfurt Parliament, uh, a institution established by Northern German customs unions, like the Zalveren Union, which was basically a chamber of commerce for German industrialists, businessmen, which you obviously would associate with classical liberalism. They want to have some type of Republican form of government that would uh, favor industry and favor modernization. Uh, Frederick William is not uh, interested in that. He is um, very much of the mindset that these Republican uh, movements are not noble. And the quotation on the second page of your handout uh, indicates that you know that the the liberal bourgeois class is beggars uh, without money, land, or power, and and that they are bankrupt speculators and cast off popular sovereignty. So he rejects this idea of being a figurehead. However, he also suffers from syphilis and is eventually declared insane and abdicates the throne which brings us William I, who is essentially manipulated by Otto von Bismarck, a real politic, meaning a amoral manipulator of the geopolitical system that sees where the angles are in terms of international interests and is able to uh, truly and uh, efficiently turn the European powers against each other to allow Germany to become the dominant force in Europe at the time. And here's a quotation from Bismarck. The position of Prussia and Germany will be decided not by its liberalism, but by its power, not through speeches and majority decisions are great questions of the day decided. That was the great mistake of 1848. Remember the uh, revolutions of 1848, but rather through blood and iron in this famous quotation is what uh, leads to him being known as the Iron Chancellor of Germany. And we have a cartoon here uh, on the left where we can see that the leading royalty of Europe is merely puppets and the puppeteer is Bismarck himself. We have the Tsar, we have the, uh, um, uh, the Prussian monarch, and um, also the uh, Austrian monarch at the time. And then on the right, uh, we see a sort of marauding Bismarck uh, swallowing up the many different and plural uh, or particular uh, states of Germany. And this is a, a map at the time indicating where the Prussian influence held sway in the uh, darker blue. Um, this is the area that, that was controlled by Prussia. And I would highlight in the east the fact that they controlled the most industrial industrialized portion of Germany in the Rhineland. And uh, in the north, the province Schleswig-Holstein, which was very wealthy and prosperous. And then in the sort of mint green color you have uh, a, a lot more Austrian and Catholic influence in Bavaria. And this is just another uh, image uh, representing that in higher resolution. This is a nice image of a uh, board game 
I don't know if any of you are indulging yourselves in, in board games, a sort of antiquated form of entertainment from the previous century, but now that we're in quarantine, it might be something that you're dusting off and, and finding in your parents' closet or basement. But this is a board game that actually memorialized the Austro-Prussian War uh, and played by children in 1866, if you can imagine that. And what the Austro-Prussian War represents is the first step that Bismarck, Bismarck sets up in his multi-step, multi-faceted uh, program of turning European powers against each other so that Germany can emerge as the dominant force in the 19th century. The uh, province, as I had, had said earlier, the uh, province of Schleswig Holstein was very uh, wealthy. Um, it's actually where, even today, uh, some of the most expensive, um, you know, uh, items in, in Germany come from, like veal. Uh, they're known for veal. Veal a la Holstein is a famous German dish. It's, um, and if anybody knows about veal, it's, you know, a small calf that's kept in a cage cruelly to produce very soft tender meat um, which is uh, typically fried in germany uh, that's what wiener schnitzel is and then a la holstein is um, accompanied with a fried egg and anchovies on top of it but in any event bismarck had um, produced because he controlled the media and the newspapers in northern germany he had produced a lot of anxiety that austria was trying to make secret deals with Denmark to take control of this province and oppress uh, the people there, which allowed him to develop popular support for uh, a war with Austria and Prussia. As he goes to war with Austria, he also makes deals with Napoleon III of France to stay out of the war if um, Napoleon III will receive certain territorial compensation in uh, Piedmont and also uh, makes a deal with the Italian nation state uh, to get Austria out of any remaining uh, centers of, of Northern European and uh, Northern Italian uh, geography. And Simultaneously to all this, he is, in 1863, helping the Tsar of Russia put down a Polish rebellion, where the Poles had been trying to get their own independent nation state. So it's very easy for him to isolate Austria uh, and force them into a treaty, the Treaty of Vienna, which really eliminates them as a rival in terms of the unification of Germany but in the process also creating a situation where the Italian government is sympathetic to Bismarck and Prussia and the Russian Tsar is also um, on his side. After the defeat of Austria, uh, Bismarck also eliminates any of their territorial ambitions in Southern Germany with the Treaty of Prague, which is located in modern day Czech, Czech Republic. And this is the latest war map of Europe at the time. And you'll see many of these throughout the late 19th century, early 20th century. You may have looked at them already in your 10th or 11th grade class if you covered World War I, where different uh, countries are personified. And in the middle here, we have a bloated um, uh, Prussian uh, Bismarck, who is sort of squeezing other territories out of his space and crushing uh, the Austrian Empire uh, with his left knee. And what happens next is really the foundation to what leads to World War I. The French uh, Napoleon III becomes very anxious when he finds out a Hohenzollern is in line to take the Spanish throne. Uh, the Hohenzollern is a very old, traditional Prussian noble family, and he is concerned about being um, surrounded by Prussians. So he begins to make moves 
on Germany and what Bismarck had essentially done at this point, if you look at your handout, um, the bottom of page two, is um, set up a whole system of uh, checks against France. France was without an ally at this point in all of continental Europe. Uh, you'll see that uh, Italy is holding a grudge against France for the loss of Nice and Savoy during the Risorgimento. Russia is um, remembering Prussia's help with crushing the Poles. And to solidify it even further, Bismarck produces a secret telegram from Napoleon III, whether it's real or not, we don't know, where uh, France is demanding Belgium and Luxembourg as a settlement during the Austrian-Prussian War. And Great Britain certainly doesn't like this because Britain has always had a national policy to keep Belgium neutral and independent because that is the closest geographic uh, spot to, to England. So if you're going to launch an attack on the British Isles, it would be from Belgium. So Bismarck and Wilhelm I march on Paris. And what you're seeing here in the image is a very famous painting of them declaring the, proclaiming the German Empire the Reich in uh, 1877, or 1871 rather, the painting is 1877, at the Palace Versailles. So it's really rubbing the French's noses in it. And also uh, as a result, the territorial uh, agreements and compensations of the Franco-Prussian War include Alsace-Lorraine, which was a very wealthy French province now occupied by the Germans. So a great deal of resentment here um, that lasts uh, throughout uh, the next, you know, 40, 50 years. The German, um, the, uh, the other results of this um, also are the adoption of certain pseudoscientific theories parallel, some of them parallel to the, the war, uh, pseudoscience that was based on Darwin's theories, for instance, um, or misunderstandings of Darwin's theories like social Darwinism that was, was becoming popular, eugenics was becoming popular. And then of course, a long tradition of, in both France and Germany, anti-Semitism, which uh, becomes um, very volatile in the proclamation of, of the German empire and France's loss. Leading us to the Dreyfus affair, which we'll be talking about in our seminar. This is a picture from uh, the Petit Journal of um, 1895. Now, just to give a very brief overview of what's going on after the, the Germans leave France, a couple of things happen. The um, citizens of the Paris uh, blockade the streets and set up the Paris Commune, which is very short-lived, uh, a sort of leftist experiment within the city, but the government that is formed um, after Napoleon III uh, is a Republican government and it swiftly uh, gets rid of the Paris Commune and it is run by um, Louis Adolphe Thiers, um, which if you skip a little bit ahead in your handout past the Austrian-Hungarian data, um, he establishes a provisional republic in an armistice with Germany. And um, what starts to happen at this point within the German government and the parliament is a strong, strong nationalist movement similar to Germany. And it, it anti-Semitism rears its ugly head in several ways. Um, first of all, the loss of um, France to Germany during the Franco-Prussian War is um, something that's put on this, this French officer, um, Alfred Dreyfus, who actually, for all intents and purposes, assimilates into the French army as a Frenchman. And very uh, little of his Jewish identity is maintained, and um, the people who frame him within the army uh, are kind of hard pressed to find evidence that he had any sort of um, treasonous activity that would have supported Germany in the war. 
Um, and this becomes a sort of international episode, as you're going to find out, because Dreyfus is sent to Devil's Island, a uh, penal colony off the coast of South America. And, uh, you know, the, the um, Jewish um, literati, the, the um, cultural Jewish figures of the time, make his cause an international cause to get him released. And um, he is depicted in poetry, literature, and uh, visual art at the time. Um, so you have these, these two things going on with European diaspora Jews in the sense that the anti-Semitism is again on the rise being supported by new pseudoscientific ideas like social Darwinism in this time. But you also have a Zionist movement uh, as well to, to call for the establishment of a Jewish state. So there's Jewish nationalism as well and Dreyfus becomes sort of a central figure of this. The other thing that's interesting is the um, corruption around the Panama Canal, which also enhances anti-Semitism in France. The huge number of parliamentarians um, in France get uh, caught in this corruption scandal where they have a Panama Canal company trying to build uh, the canal um, that the United States eventually takes over. And uh, a huge number of political figures being bribed by the company and the company goes under in a, in a financial disaster and the government becomes bankrupt and many of these uh, members of the republic are, are put on trial or sent to jail um, including even you know some famous ones Clemenceau who eventually um, comes back and becomes prime minister during World War One uh, and um, and many others uh, including two very prominent um, Jewish members of parliament, uh, Baron Jacques Reinach and uh, Cornelius Hertz. Ironically, bitter enemies. They, uh, Reinach was a right-wing agitator and Hertz was on the left side of politics. But, be, and, and not, neither of them are actually guilty of receiving bribes from the company, but acted as middlemen um, who transferred money from accounts, from the company's accounts to other members of government accounts, and they become sort of symbols of this um, nasty Jewish stereotype that the money in governments all over Europe are, is being controlled um, by, by the Jews and that they are, and that's going to lead to the degradation of European governments. So. Um, it just enhances the anti-Semitic um, uh, movement of what was becoming a very right-wing government. Wilhelm II, who eventually takes control of Germany, is also an interesting Prussian figure. He is born uh, with uh, some problems. Uh, he is um, uh, he suffers from a disfigured left arm and you can see he's covering it up in the photograph here. This is a major difficulty for him throughout his youth because the Prussian culture was one of great Spartan military uh, chauvinism that being masculine, being strong, being a good equestrian horse rider was really important and valued above everything else among the Junker class which is the nobility and he was um, inadequate in all of these physical ways. So many historians talk about the psychological impact that that had on him. He also was relatives. Um, he was a grandson of Queen Victoria and cousins to the monarchs in Russia and also in England and felt uh, that this inferiority complex even further meant that he needed to compete with his uh, family members. And so he uh, accelerates the militarization of Germany and uses industry to do that. He dismisses Bismarck uh, because he will not be controlled by a minister um, and sort of plunges Germany into a, um, a one-way ticket to World War I by agitating and uh, aggressively uh, challenging 
um, Russia, his uh, Tsar Nicholas, his, co his cousin, um, and uh, his English cousins as well, in an attempt to establish like German superiority and supremacy on the uh, on the continent. And simultaneously, we have again these modernist movements like Houston Stuart Chamberlain's racial theory that which are developing and being adopted not just by the German government but the the French. Uh, you know, government, uh, members of the English government buying into these pseudoscientific ideas that of racial theory and um, uh, phrenology, like the uh, understanding the inferiorities of different races through the study of the skeletal structure and physiognomy. And this is rooted very much in what we see unfolding into the 20th century and ultimately leading to uh, a strong uh, eugenics movement, not only in the United States, or not only in Germany, but in the United States, um, and then wealthy industrialists in the United States bringing it back to Germany during the Weimar Republic after World War I. Um, and then, of course, we know where this goes with uh, the Nazis. And then finally, the and this is on your handout, uh, the, the other element that comes out of this is a weakened Austria-Hungarian empire. And you can look at the data, which speaks for itself, uh, which shows that the Austrian-Hungarian empire is not going to uh, live long. And um, primarily because many of these different groups, these many different ethnic groups are going to demand their own nation states. And the cartoon depicts that where you see uh, the Austrian government officials, the, the Russian Tsar, uh, the, um, I had said Franz Joseph earlier uh, mistakenly um, when we were talking about Wilhelm I, and that's him uh, sitting on top of the pot with the sideburns, and then we have the Kaiser, all trying to keep what they call the Balkan Troubles or the powder keg of Europe under control. And as we know from previous classes, this is is not possible and uh, eventually all of these different uh, resentments alliances and um, uh, you know secret dealings that are occurring as part of this bismarck system up through the early 20th century are sparked and um, um, set ablaze by the assassination of the archduke of Austria by a Serbian nationalist, and we have World War One.